This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices Episode 375 was produced on May 11, 2023. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Simplify Asset Management Chief Market Strategist and Portfolio Manager Mike Green returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss the banking crisis, the debt ceiling debacle, de-dollarization, and artificial intelligence in this week's interview. And I'm Patrick Serezna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, May 10th, 2023. The S&P 500 was up 1.1%, closing at 4152 We'll take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch in the post-game segment. The U.S. dollar index up 0.2%, closing at 101.41, continues to remain weak, trading along 52-week lows at a critical support. The June WTI crude oil contract up 5.8%, closing at 72.56. Finally, a reflexive rally from the extremely oversold state. We'll look at that chart, and Eric will have the EIA inventory data in the post-game segment. Gold remains unchanged week over week at 2037. Copper also flat on the week, closing at 384. Uranium down 0.1%, closing at 5330, continues to hold the breakout at higher highs. And the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield up 10 basis points, closing at 344 points. The key news to watch on Friday is the release of the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Numbers. And next week, we get the Empire State Manufacturing Index and retail sales numbers. This week's feature interview guest is Simplify Asset Management Chief Market Strategist and Portfolio Manager, Mike Green. Eric, why did we get Mike back on the show this week? Patrick, as I explained to listeners last week, we've been focused on getting listeners who have a good background to talk about the banking crisis, whether it's over, whether it's just getting started, where it's headed, and so forth. Chris Whalen was an excellent fit. Mike Green is another excellent fit for that topic. And Mike's also a listener favorite, and we're long overdue to get him back on the show. Eric's interview with Mike Green is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. If you invest to bring about a world powered by green energy, you should meet Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy that serves as a one-stop shop for green energy investors in Europe. Respect Energy brings together independent power producers, accredited and institutional investors holding assets in renewables, or undertaking investments in new green energy production, such as wind and solar photovoltaic power plants. More than 600 institutional and accredited investors have already entrusted Respect Energy with the sale of their electricity production, portfolio management, O&M services, EPC, and project development. If you want to invest in green energy in Europe with the help of a trusted partner, contact Respect Energy today and ask for a tailor-made solution. For more information, visit respect.energy. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Mike Green, Chief Strategist and Portfolio Manager for Simplify Asset Management. Mike, it's been way too long. It's great to get you back on the show. I want to talk about everything that's going on, but let's start with this banking crisis. You know, this is one of those things where it seems like everything's okay, but well, wait a minute. The, everybody, this whole system is designed with an incentive for them to tell us everything is okay when it's not okay because this is a confidence game. So how do we make sense of this? How do you even know when the banking crisis is over? Well, the, the quick answer is, is that the banking crisis will be over when we actually start to treat the underlying condition. And the underlying condition, unfortunately, is, is that banks themselves are short a 
or, or depositors, or more accurately, long a call option on their deposits at banks. They can withdraw them at any time. The value of that call option is a function of the spread between interest rates that are available elsewhere, for example, in money market funds versus the interest rate that they can earn on their deposits. And the value of any call option is positively associated with the increase in volatility. So by hiking interest rates incredibly rapidly and driving an extraordinary spread between what banks could afford to spend and to pay on their, their deposits and what it can be earned on returns from U.S. treasuries, they created a huge uh, hole in bank balance sheets. The only way to reverse this was one to have moved much more slowly to this process of this level of rates. And two, now, unfortunately, they're going to have to reverse it. Mike, let's talk about how far we are in this story and what's coming next. Because, you know, first it was one bank, Silicon Valley, and don't worry, nothing to see here. It's all contained. It's it's just one. There won't be any more. Then, you know, we had Credit Suisse, then First Republic. Um, it seems to me like it's pretty darn clear what's going on here, which is that we have a contagious situation, that the banking system is was not ready to respond to the Fed hiking as aggressively and quickly as it has. Banks are in trouble if anybody withdraws their, uh, their money. And now I think we've got a, a systemic problem where there's a strong incentive for everybody to withdraw their money because there's not a lot of good reasons to stay with your smaller regional bank when federal policy is pretty much, you know, skewing the risk in, in favor or to the benefit of the bigger banks. Uh, it seems to me like we're systematically putting the regional banking system out of business. Almost looks like we're doing it on purpose. What's really going on here? Well, unfortunately, I think that's largely correct, although I would highlight that, you know, when we talk about regional banks, we're actually not talking about local community banks. We're talking about very sizable institutions. In the case of both Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic, these are actually institutions that had nationwide footprints. They had branches across multiple state lines and were in asset numbers that are measured in the hundreds of billions of dollars as compared to just the billions, which, of course, feels like a tiny sum these days, except for uh, any individual. Um, you know, the, the, the simple reality is I don't think that there was intent behind this. I don't think that the objective of the Fed was to try to systematically eliminate the regional banking system. I think that this is a foreseeable byproduct of a very flawed policy of trying to tackle inflation with the extremely rudimentary and blunt tools of interest rate policy. So, it, you know, many people will correctly point out that the high inflation levels that we had are unacceptable. The question is, how do you handle that process? The Fed behaved like anyone with a hammer, treated it, everything looked like a nail. And so they pounded the crap, I think is the technical term, out of screws and nuts and bolts. Did that happen because the Fed perceived that there was a time urgency that, you know, if they didn't go as quickly as they did, that inflation was going to run away? I mean, why were they in such a hurry? So when we think about solving the banking crisis, ultimately, we have to reverse what caused this. The question is, why did the Fed choose, such, choose this path if it was almost inevitably going to lead to this outcome, right? When you hike the interest rates in this manner, there's very predictable effects this type of extreme move in interest rates understandably leads to deposit flight as people recognize that there are far better alternatives in keeping money with banks. Likewise, the assets that the banks hold, various forms of um, mortgages or longer term government debt of any variety is going to plummet in value. And so the underlying collateral that is held in the form of assets against the liabilities of deposits deteriorates the bank credit quality deteriorates regardless of the credit of their quality of their underwriting. So the, the question is kind of, you know, why did this happen? Why did we engage in this behavior? And there's, you know, a couple of interesting answers. The first one is very straightforward. It's my preferred solution, which is simply that Jay Powell is incompetent. He missed the inflation story to begin with. He followed that up by deciding that he was going to move much more rapidly to try to make make up for lost time. And as uh, Warren Buffett said, you know, many years ago, you can't get a woman to have a baby in one month by having 
uh, sex with nine different women over the course of one month, right? It still is going to take as much time as it's going to take. We simply push through too many hikes in too inappropriate of a fashion. In my opinion, it's evidence of his incompetence. Now, the defenders of Jay Powell's strategy, I think, actually have an even more problematic rationale for it, which is that this is an individual who believes that he is personally responsible for the direction of the U.S. banking system, the direction of the U.S. economy, and that he is a man on a mission to weed out all forms of malinvestment and financialization from the U.S. economy. My solution that he's incompetent simply means we made a bad choice. The second interpretation, unfortunately, suggests that this is an individual who lied to Congress, who misrepresented his objectives, and has decided in a Robert Moses-type framework that he is the unique individual who has the vision for the U.S. economy. That is way outside of his purview. And if anything, I would suggest that anyone who thinks that that's the appropriate actions for a Fed governor to take is exactly as Jay Powell effectively entranced with the mythology around Paul Volcker and far more interested in his legacy than he is in actually solving the problems at hand. Let's talk about the behavior, not just of the regulators, but of the marketplace itself, because it doesn't make sense to me. Let's put this in context, Mike, what we've just been through, what the world has just been through. The, the big story of 2023 so far has been the Fed raised rates too quickly to the point that it shocked the banking system. We had uh, the collapse of Silicon Valley and First Republic, the near collapse of several other banks, and the potential that this could turn into a great big thing. If you think uh, in terms of, uh, of rational expectations theory, the way that markets are supposed to work, okay, what happens when something really big and bad happens? People think about it and they say, oh shit, you know, let's not let this happen to me. So where was the problem? It was managing fixed income duration risk. In other words, the kind of stuff that bond managers do for a living got done poorly and that's what led to all of this. So you would think that what would be the hottest thing right now would be, okay, whoever the active bond managers are who did see this coming, the guys who were smart enough to know that interest rates were going to be increased, that we were that, that this whole thing was coming, everybody should be just ringing their phones off the hook. Everybody wants into managed bond funds. But this article that you sent me in Pensions and Investment says almost the exact opposite. Why would people be running away from active management of the exact kind of risk that just blew up on people that got complacent and didn't pay attention to it? Well, as, as you know, Eric, like one of the things I'm most well known for is the work that I've done around passive investing, the role that it plays in markets. And the article that I sent you is actually reprinted in Pension Investments, I assume with permission from Bloomberg, who it originated with. And it's a profile of the growth of passive investing in fixed income. And what they're highlighting is, is that passive investing has gone from 13% of the fixed income market to north of 30% in the last decade, despite the outperformance of active managers and the challenges that we've seen within the overall bond markets have led to losses at many of these passive funds that were worse than the active managers. Now, this creates a quandary for the defenders of passive management because we're not seeing superior performance, and yet the same type of flow dynamics are happening within fixed income that are happening in the equity markets. And it goes a step further if you actually read the article. And again, this is available on Bloomberg and in various other sources. It's, it profiles uh, Vanguard's trillion dollar man, right? This is an individual who has no opinion. And it is linked for our uh, registered users in your research round okay, people as well. And so this is, this is a, um, an individual who has no opinion on Fed policy, right? is not attempting to predict it, is not attempting to do anything. And actually, if you think about what's happening with the growth of passive vehicles and the structure that they use in bond markets, passive bond funds uh, allocate investments on the basis of the market capitalization of the various bond issuers. This is precisely why we saw the duration exposure, the riskiness of the bond market, its exposure to lower interest rates or to move higher in interest rates rise by more than any time in history. 
it's a very technical explanation, but if you th simply think about what bonds do best as the Fed cuts interest rates, low coupon, very long dated bonds, right? So a hundred year bond, zero coupon. If it's issued at 2% interest rates and interest rates go to zero, that bond is going to explode in value. It becomes a giant portion of the index. And in fact, this is exactly what we saw. We saw bonds like the Austrian century bond that was issued you know, to uh, much ridicule in 2019, I believe it was, appreciated to more than two times its face value, right? That meant that it received twice the weight within the bond indices. Who's buying it in that proportion? Turns out it wasn't European pension plans trying to asset liability match, et cetera. The largest buyer was Vanguard, right? What we saw was the impact of passive investing on bond markets in the presence of interest rate cuts caused the duration sensitivity of the bond market to explode. Those same bond funds became the biggest beneficiary of the decline in the bond market by attracting a record $1 trillion in excess of the outflows from active managers. So in other words, despite the fact that the bond funds underperformed, despite the fact that the active managers outperformed, we fired the active managers and replaced them with the low cost passive managers who did nothing but try to mimic the index, right? Now, why would that happen? Well, the answer is really straightforward. This has always been a marketing story. This has always been a distribution story on the passive side. Yes, a very compelling narrative of low cost asset management can be made, but the tools that are being used and the approaches that are being used are robbing the market of any intelligence or predictive capability. So now, of course, what we're seeing is we're seeing markets that are incapable of making forecasts. We've watched super talented you know, macro managers who bet on higher interest rates, get blown up in the first quarter of this past year, the number of victims of a two-year bond or a short-term level of interest rates that got way out ahead of itself in a totally irrational framework built around Jay Powell's hikes, you know, blew up in everybody's face in the first quarter, created incredible losses, took out guys like Adam Levinson of, of uh, Graticule, caused huge losses from former Soros investors, et cetera. This is a direct byproduct of a market that no longer incorporates information. And as that article makes painfully clear, the only thing that matters is flows. Mike, let's talk about the debt ceiling. You know, it seems like it happens each spring. We go through this this whole thing. I thought the most interesting comment that I've read so far was from Stan Druckenmiller, who said, it is just so sad that everybody is focused on the debt ceiling rather than on the more substantive issue, which is what we're going to do when the problem that the debt ceiling was designed to address never gets uh, addressed, which is we have a major fiscal problem with too much debt. Um, it seems like we're not going to focus on that. We're going to have the usual preoccupation with the debt ceiling and let's make a big political crisis out of it. How do you see this uh, proceeding from here? Is this going to be the, the big issue for the next several weeks? Well, unfortunately, I think they're all linked, right? So if we were actually experiencing a collapsing equity and bond market, if the concerns of individuals like Stan Druckenmiller were being properly reflected in volatility or in asset prices, you know, and I say properly because candidly, I can't know what those are, but voters like Stan Druckenmiller in terms of discretionary management have clearly expressed their views. If that were actually happening, my sense is, is that the urgency of avoiding this issue would be significantly greater. Unfortunately, again, going back to the point that I make on passive, until people start to lose their jobs and until the flows into these passive vehicles stops, I don't know how markets are supposed to incorporate this information and send the information to Washington about how serious this problem is. And so unfortunately, just like COVID, and I hate to use that analogy, but I'm, you'll understand why, you know, if you remember in COVID, it became very clear to financial market participants that something important was happening in December, January, December 2019, January 2020. And unfortunately, those who tried to get ahead of it by shorting in January were blown up as the market went to new all-time highs in February, right? Only to collapse into March. So you, you've seen this type of behavior before where the crisis approaches 
The market is blithely incapable of absorbing the information, and it's exacerbated under these conditions because what's happening is this Janet Yellen is effectively paying down the checkbook without putting any money back into the savings account. So by not issuing bonds, the key role of bonds is not to actually fund the government. It's to soak up the liquidity of the money that is spent by the government, right? You're effectively turning around and saying to somebody who receives dollars, I want you to put them into a, you know, to steal from the Al Gore uh, parody on SNL many, many years ago. I want you to put them into a lockbox that we call a bond where you really can't access them for an extended period of time that supports the value of the dollar by providing a non-inflationary place to put your excess savings. When we stop issuing those, those excess savings have to go into alternative assets. They have to go into spending, et cetera. It's a support for the economy and financial assets that is unfortunately going to reverse really hard the minute we decide to lift the debt ceiling. Then we're going to get hit by the double whammy of the Treasury General account, that checking account being refilled, and the quantitative tightening of Jay Powell coming through into a market that is already vulnerable because banks are increasingly unwilling to extend credit. So this is shaping up to be a very adverse event for markets, and the markets have no mechanism for incorporating that information short of massive employment loss. Let's talk about what would happen if there was a technical default, because something I've noticed this time, although I do think the most likely base case scenario is same as usual. We're going to raise the ceiling and, and, and go through the motions as we usually do. I'm noticing a larger number of politicians being a little bit bolder, though, talking about maybe going ahead and allowing a technical default to occur for negotiating purposes in Congress. Mike, I'm personally of the view that that's really, really playing with fire. I think even a technical default that gets corrected and cured a few days later is potentially a big deal. What do you think? Is it a big deal if we had a default technically that just lasted a few days, then they you know, pay it off afterwards? So I, I think that there's two answers to that question, unfortunately. Um, the first is I agree with you. I think the gamesmanship and the brinksmanship are naturally enhanced by, in my opinion, the increasingly uh, bloviating uh, nature of our politicians. There are no real consequences for absolutely stupid statements on either side of the aisle. I'm not defending one party versus another, but we've created conditions under which they can say anything they want, much like we behave on social media without, as Mike Tyson observes, getting punched in the face. That's raised the stakes and raised the risks of an error. And as Stan Druckenmiller correctly points out, you know, there is no substantive discussion around what do we do once we resolve this very short term problem. And I agree with him that that's the much more tragic component to it. If there is a technical default, the answer has two separate components to it. First, there are unquestionably individuals who will encounter stress because their social security check doesn't clear or isn't received because payments are delayed to various contractors, et cetera. That in turn creates a ripple of liquidity through the system that causes very unpredictable results. The second component, though, is, is that a premium suddenly gets placed on holding cash to meet obligations. Because if you think about what's actually happening within most corporate treasuries or in many ways in most people's portfolios, they're expecting a series of cash flows structured from maturing bonds, returning principal. You may choose to reinvest those. You can also use those to pay your bills. The minute it becomes questionable whether or not you're going to get paid on time through the maturation or the interest coupons on those, those securities, you suddenly have to raise the quantity of cash that you're holding. And if you increase the quantity of cash, that creates the sort of catastrophic outcomes that ripple through the system where the cost, you know, effectively hoarding of cash raises the cost of capital for everybody in the economy. There's a further component of it just makes us look like morons, right? And that matters on the global stage when you're supposed to be the world's policeman. We joke about cops going to donut shops as compared to doing their jobs. And ultimately, that lowers our trust and satisfaction with policing efforts creates conditions under which we start talking about ridiculous things like defunding the police. When we see this type of behavior out of Washington, we want to defund the government. And suddenly we're left with really poor decision making. 
Mike, let's go a little further down that path because I think this de-dollarization trend is something we really need to talk about again. You know, when I first started talking about de-dollarization as, as I became aware of Sergei Glazyev's efforts more than a decade ago, people just laughed me out of the room. You know, the U.S. dollar is the center of the universe. It's never going to change. It's always going to be that way. It's the, the, the world's reserve currency. It seems to me, Mike, that we're getting closer to the point where the pushback, the, the blowback from other countries who are sick of that, um, th they don't really have a viable alternative yet, but it seems like they're working pretty darn hard on coming up with one. Where do you think this is all headed with, with respect to the attitudes and intentions of other countries regarding uh, continuing the U.S. dollar-centric global financial system? Well, I think you hit on two very important distinctions. Right. One is there is unquestionably a desire from other parts of the globe to not use the dollar standard for the dollar is world reserve currency. And I think this actually brings up an important point that most people fail to fully appreciate. You know, For most of the second half of the 20th century, the dollar was actually not the global reserve currency or the world's reserve currency. There were two world reserve currencies. There was a segment of the global economy that utilized dollars and was engaged in trade amongst Western nations. And then there was a second ruble block that relied ultimately on the Soviet Union for its monetary policy, which was, to put it politely, somewhat disastrous. My sense is, is that we're looking at something, unfortunately, very similar. And just as the outgrowth of the Soviet ruble-based block was a function of the rejection by Stalin of the uh, U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency, there's a very real risk that Xi or Putin or others who may follow in their footsteps chooses to try to amplify their national objectives over the global environment. And in fact, that seems increasingly likely. The problem with those models is that, you know, and, and I've said this elsewhere, the expression all roads lead to Rome it is equally true that those roads are bidirectional and lead from Rome, but the simple reality is, is that at the heart of any empire or global reserve currency, you need to have consumption. And the problem for Russia, the problem for China, is that they actually don't have consumption centered at, at the heart of their economies. Right? So China wants to export its surplus to the world and is hoping to finance that by getting people to take Chinese yuan. That unfortunately doesn't create the reverse demand for that Chinese yuan in the other direction. The Chinese have no mechanism other than lending money to allow people to obtain those yuan. And in turn, that system then becomes even more levered than the dollar system that we've described. So at its core, it's a fundamentally flawed attempt to replace the U.S. dollar as I expect in almost all fundamentally flawed attempts, it will gain momentum and then collapse. And I think the, the much more real risk than a collapse in the dollar is actually a collapse in the Chinese yuan as the noose is increasingly drawn around China that is a combination of their poor behavior on the global stage and the inconsistencies of that model that create conditions not dissimilar to what happened to the Soviet Union as its capacity for absorbing the risks of the rest of the system began to collapse. They were forced to shed their satellites. I can't see any difference here in China. Mike, I think this is a good time to bring up some of the topics that you and I have been talking about for years now, but we've been talking about them in the might happen someday. You and I both said, look, the cryptocurrency thing is interesting, but what's really going to be interesting is when CBDCs hit the stage because governments are going to have the opposite objectives than the cypherpunks. They're, they're going to try to design these digital currency systems to limit and, and uh, oversee as much much of your life as possible, as opposed to giving you economic freedom, which was the goal of cryptocurrency. Well, you and I talk on a podcast about that and, you know, few people listen, but now it's all happening. Right now, we're seeing CBDCs hit the stage. We're seeing a lot of governments starting to talk finally about whether they're going to outlaw cryptocurrencies completely. There's more and more going on on that front, but particularly 
what I see that I think is most interesting is government starting to recognize what I said in my book five years ago or six years ago now, which is that the biggest benefactor of digital currency is governments because of the opportunity to have a greater control over society. Um, seems like it's now finally hitting the stage, the things we've been talking about. Do you agree that it's happening now or starting to happen now? How long do you think it will play out? What do you think happens? Well, unfortunately, I agree with you. And um, unfortunately, my my worst fears are being realized. And, 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 and they're somewhat encapsulated in the earlier discussion around Jay Powell, right? Had the crypto community or the Bitcoin community, particularly the Bitcoin maximalists, actually spent their time arguing for here's what we would like out of a monetary system as compared to you must adopt our system, which will make me extremely rich or it's all going to collapse and you're all going to die, uh, which is a summary effectively of what they said. You know, we might have actually made some progress to saying, no, here are the important components of a digital currency and a system that is based on instantaneous settlement, et cetera, um, that has the potential to include all the control features. But if you behave as a bunch of anarcho-capitalists and effectively say there's no role for the state in currency provision, there's no role for the state in policy setting, the state is naturally going to create currencies or create tools that fight back against that in their creation process. As a result, the CBDCs that are being proposed have exactly as you described, significant control features and significant capability to effectively strip away the privacy of, of individual transaction histories, individual behaviors, et cetera, that candidly I value very, very deeply. Right? And I, it's important for people to understand this. I, I don't care if you and I decide to use a $20 bill to put a side bet onto economic activity that we can describe as, well, the Buffalo Bills defeat the San Francisco 49ers. Right? Completely irrelevant, allows me to use money to settle private debts in a way that says to the government, this is really none of your business. And it allows me to express my personal preferences without the concern of who's looking over my shoulder, right? When you introduce the type of social credit systems that China is proposing that are being increasingly incorporated into the technology and tools that the U.S. is proposing for its CBDC, when we create those types of dynamics, we're actually creating a society that becomes almost a, uh, you know, Plato's cave imitation of an actual economy where we spend more of our time trying to figure out what are people watching in my behavior as compared to what do I actually want to accomplish with my behavior? I'm terrified of it. And I, it makes me extremely sad that we've gotten to this point, but we allowed ourselves to be led here by a bunch of people who had no idea what they were talking about. Mike, I want to move on to a topic that I've been thinking about a lot lately. I'm pretty sure you have as well. And that's artificial intelligence, generative AI, and the trend. There's been a major acceleration of progress in artificial intelligence in the last 6 to 12 months. I'm not sure if it's going to continue, but frankly, I don't think it's a good thing. Um, chat GPT, generative AI in general, what do you think? Where do you think it's headed? And am I right to be concerned? So the, the quick answer is, I think that there's, as with all technologies, there's both promise and danger, right? If you go back to John Henry versus the machine, you know, the famous poem, the argument uh, effectively boiled down to the, the strongest man could defeat the machine, but he died in the process, right? Now, I kind of look at that and I say, well, that's a silly thing to do. And so we're somewhat forced into embracing aspects of this doesn't mean we need to fully embrace it. doesn't mean we shouldn't have conversations about how we want to place limits around it, or even more importantly, how we want to deal with the social ramifications of the equivalent of replacing much of the agricultural labor that existed in the U.S. in the 19th century or many places around the world that led to the general impoverishment of small farmers, um, forced people into city environments, etc., and of course, we're all familiar with Upton Sinclair, the jungle and the uh, you know disasters that befell human beings when we didn't properly consider the costs of putting people into warehouses, factories, etc. So we're in a similar situation here, although this is a different type of technology because it actually, instead of replacing human physical capability, it replaces humans intellectual capability. 
And this is happening at exactly the same time that for the very first time, we're experiencing symptoms of surplus of the highly educated members of our society. Um, I've actually written about this extensively on my Substack. You can, uh, I'll provide a link uh, so readers can take a look at that. But one of the things that's so interesting about what's happening is, is that in the past basically 15 years, we've seen nearly a doubling of the number of people in the labor force that have college degrees, right? We're starting to see for the very first time, the levels of unemployment for those with college degrees begin to move towards the levels of unemployment that have historically been associated with far less skilled occupations. The real challenge that that creates is that individuals incur significant costs to go to college. They give up many years of unproductive labor as they pursue that, although it's debatable whether they're pursuing college degrees or college partying degrees in many situations. And unfortunately, again, we've robbed the system of the ability to signal that through our policy of educational support in the United States, where we treat a degree in French medieval literature as worthy of the same type of support as a degree in mechanical engineering. So we have all sorts of problems in the system. Unfortunately, that's now coming to a head at exactly the point that we're introducing this AI. And I think what we're unfortunately going to see is the same type of displacement and challenges on a social framework that occurred during these periods of transition in, the, in historical dynamics. The long recession of the 1870s, the Great Depression, was the long recession of the 1870s was largely the displacement of agricultural labor. There's phenomenal discussions around this in various historical books looking back on those dynamics. But the introduction of things like the McCormick Reaper, et cetera, dramatically improved production and ultimately led to significant unemployment or underemployment in the agricultural sector that caused people to flow into cities where they became available for industrial employment. And that industrial employment peaked and began to flip with the Great Depression, where we could no longer project that in a linear fashion. You know, that type of disruption, I think, sits ahead of us with AI. And so I'm less concerned about the deployment of the AI and the risks of quote unquote paperclip world where an inappropriate series of instructions have been handed off to AI and it proceeds to destroy the world. I'm much more concerned about the social ramifications of that degree of displacement without a strong consideration for how do we share the benefits associated with those gains. If we simply allow them to accrue to those who happen to own those technologies and benefit from the first mover dynamics, that's going to be really unfortunate. It's going to lead to significant social stress that I think we're really unprepared for. Mike, we're in strong agreement that the issue is not the obvious issue. And I just am not sure how many levels of unobvious issue there are, because most people, when they talk about AI, the, the specific fear they have is this idea of a singularity where the machines become smarter than we are and they plot an evil, sinister, you know, conspiracy to, to get rid of the humans. That's the, the scenario, you know, that, essentially the, the Terminator movie scenario. I don't worry about that at all. I don't think that's a big risk. I think it's just the kind of stuff that science fiction causes human beings to get fearful about. But when I think about just the risk of economic and social disruptions, if the what's left of the middle class gets replaced by a combination of screen scraping and chat GPT, um, it's the, the elimination of the, of the middle class that's the social event that leads to potentially, you know, violence and all kinds of, of crazy things happening. Um, I think that's a big risk. And I think there's also a risk that way too many people are assuming that safety mechanisms built into this, you know, don't worry, you're not going to go on to chat GPT and ask it to come up with the best strategy to bomb and take down the new World Trade Center after the last one got taken down, well, there's some kind of, you know, circuitry or, or programming in there that says, uh, I'm not allowed to help you, you know, plan terrorist acts. For the, the beginning of time, Mike, it's been very easy for people who understand technology to disable safety features like that. You know, let's, let, let's turn off that, that feature and, and, and enable the version that can do anything. Uh, I've got to believe that we're going to get to the point where everyone from terrorists to con men, I, you know, I don't think it's a, a, a fear of AI is smarter than us and it's scheming to put human beings out of work. I think it's handing 
an incredible amount of power to spammers, to con men, to online scammers, to people who run internet, you know, scams. They, they can be automated now. Right. Nigerian you don't have to be armed with chat GPT can create compelling narratives. And instead of saying, hey, I'm locked in a prison or, or you know, so-and-so prince is locked in a prison, here's a direct duplicate of an invoice that you need to pay, et cetera, right? And they can generate the invoices in real time and they can, they can, they can impersonate uh, other companies. They can create official looking documents. They could do all sorts of things. And I'm sure that the people at OpenAI have provided some control that ChatGPT won't do sinister things for you unless you figure out how to disable that, that programming. And then it will. So, so yeah, so, so I'm, I, first of all, what you're saying, I think there's definitely truth to it. Um, I, I actually tend to be a little bit more sanguine about those components. Um, there's a never ending race, right? That, that is mimicry and predation. We see it in nature where caterpillars pretend to be snakes and snakes conceal themselves with camouflage, right? So that dynamic, I think is actually, uh, well established and, is something that we just have to accept is going to occur. And the systems to deal with that tend to be pretty robust over time. The flip side of that is why do people engage in that type of behavior? And some people are crazy and, and we have you know an unfortunate epidemic of mental untreated mental illness in the United States that I think is tied to many of the social problems I was alluding to before as well as the failure of the state to make rational choices around the treatment of individuals in a manner that could be reflected in that positive way. So like there is a very real concern that somebody moves from using an AK-47 or uh, an AR-15 to using chat GPT to engage in terrorist type activities. I, I fully accept that. And, and I think that's an unfortunate reality that is exacerbated by many of the policies that we have in our country and around the globe. I think the much bigger question, though, that emerges out of that is how do we productively engage people? Because what's really happening with chat GPT, in my opinion, has a, a, a super interesting feature, right? And I, I've tried to highlight this for people, and I'll, I'll use the example again. When Europeans first came to North America, probably the single greatest skill would be to speak Native American, right? To have learned the language, to be able to function as a translator, because it gave you access to the continent of North America in a manner that allowed you to stake out land, that allowed you to properly see, survey resources and identify them, et cetera, in a world that was dominated by the agricultural resource. I actually think something very similar happened in the last 50 years in which the most valuable talent was somebody who close to natively spoke the language of computers because it liberated them to identify resources, to figure out ways of solving problems that simply didn't exist for the rest of us. Mathematics in terms of Wall Street played a similar role. The interesting feature about ChatGPT is it becomes a universal translator. Suddenly, it is a true natural language translator between an instruction set for computers and the instruction set that we're taught on an individual basis. And the world is filled with, with stories of how ChatGPT or tools like ChatGPT are leading to revolutions in code writing, computer programming, et cetera, where productivity and services is beginning to explode. Right. It's completely insane to me on a, on a services standpoint that I still have to walk into the DMV in California to do the majority of the transactions that I want to do. The idea that that could be replaced and those um, extremely surly resources that we call human beings employed at the DMV could be redeployed in productive and positive ways is an extraordinary opportunity for us as a society. Right. We're talking 70 plus percent of the economy has the opportunity to be reconfigured in the same way that agriculture was reconfigured in the same way that manufacturing was reconfigured in the 20th century. Again, the, the, the real risk, though, becomes how do we handle that transition? Because if that transition involves everybody paying a toll for any economic activity to an entity like OpenAI or Microsoft, well, then effectively all you've done is crowned you know, the Terminator or Skynet and given them the ability to place a toll on humans' ability to think and interact. And I think that's just a fundamentally flawed model. 
And so we need to be really thoughtful about how we how we engage in this process of serious discussion around how does the world change when you introduce something like English, right? Because that's really what we've done. We've created a language that allows us to natively communicate between human beings operating in a carbon-based world and computers operating in a silicon-based world. We've given ourselves the opportunity to merge those into higher functioning on both fronts. And now it becomes a question of who benefits most. We don't know the answer yet. Mike, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview, as always. Before I let you go, though, I want to talk a little bit more about what you do at Simplify Asset Management. You've been there, I think, a couple of years now. What does the company do? Uh, You run several funds. I know most of the work that you do, research and so forth, ends up on the Simplify.us website. So what can people expect to find there? What kinds of funds do you guys manage? And tell us more about what you do at Simplify. Sure. So uh, you're right. I've been with Simplify for a couple of years. I joined because there was a change in the regulatory framework that allowed us to create ETFs that incorporated the types of derivative strategies that I've been historically known for uh, prior to 2020. That really wasn't possible. So if you look at Simplify funds, you'll see very traditional exposures that have wrinkles around them that have been created uh, to improve performance, increase downside protection, allow individuals to express a particular point of view and do so in a manner that would have traditionally been associated with the high fee hedge fund world, we're introducing those into the much lower fee, much more accessible ETF space, where not only do we benefit from the change in the regulatory structure in terms of just being able to provide them, but also by incorporating strategies like hedging, et cetera, into the ETFs, we make them more tax efficient. So you don't need to transact in the same way, incurring the taxes around them. In our opinion, they're many of the best solutions for many of the problems that people face in today's markets. If you're looking across uh, what we're doing at Simplify, we offer everything ranging from commodity exposures that have incorporated a combination of trend following and strategies that are designed to identify value within the structure of the commodities markets to strategies uh, that incorporate true macro components. For example, the the simplified macro strategy to uh, levered expressions of rates so that you're able to pick up things like a short-term interest rate exposure that behaves much more like a longer-term interest rate exposure. Um, I've been thrilled to be able to partner with the, the individuals that Simplify to offer these types of products to you know, individuals who historically have not been able to access these strategies. And I encourage people to check out our products. Patrick Ceresna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Now back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, what a great interview with Mike. Now, joining us again in the post game is Nick Galarnik. Let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, it means that you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just uh, go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Mike's picture that says looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's jump into this chart on crude oil. What do you see and uh, how did the EIA inventories come in? EIA printed a build of 3 million barrels, but that was really flat after pilfering 3 million barrels out of the SPR. So, you know, you steal from one pocket, uh, pay off the other one, I guess. We're still drawing from the SPR, and we're drawing from the SPR at an increasing rate. It was 1 million barrels two weeks ago, then it was 2 million barrels last week. Now it's 3 million barrels this week at a time when they promised they'd be refilling it. Cushing, Oklahoma, building 397,000 barrels. But the big drawdowns were in finished products. So even though we've got a build on the board with crude oil showing a nice, fat 3 million barrel build, first of all, it's not really a build because it's offset by the SPR. But then when you look at finished products, the overall net petroleum products is a massive drawdown with gasoline drawing down 3.2 million barrels and distillates drawing down 4.2 million barrels. U.S. production held steady at 12.3 million barrels unchanged from last week. And that figure is a plateau. That's the highest number that we've seen post-COVID pandemic. 
Tape action, prices dipped a little bit after inventory, but then recovered. And we're really at the point now where if this was just a dead cat bounce, it's time for it to roll over. So as we approach the 13-day moving average, then the 100-day moving average above that at 76, spot 68. Those are the major resistances. If we get above those, above 76, spot 68, we could see a new trend here. But so far, we've seen so many disappointments in the crude oil market. It's time to watch most closely for the possibility of prices rolling back over to the downside. Yeah, Eric, when looking at this crude oil chart, what I did was I highlighted the high volume node consolidation area, which is essentially uh, the trade range that has dominated uh, the oil markets uh, since October of last year. And uh, what we have is a scenario where we've now once again, obviously, broke violently through this trade range. And now uh, we've seen the reflexive snapback rally. And just like you were suggesting, it's a very important moment uh, in my mind in terms of uh, what happens next. If uh, the bulls are going to in any way neutralize the sell cycle, they're going to need to get this uh, oil trading back in the trade range. So we want to see prices back in the mid 70s toward 80 and really just calm everything down. But a failure at this level, I'll have to agree with you, is, uh, is a, a vulnerable moment. And if we roll over off this level, and especially if we see any return back below $70, that would would keep the the sell window open and um, leave vulnerability to even see sixty dollars, especially if we see economic deterioration. Let's see what uh, what happens here. Very important pivot here on crude oil. All right, let's move on to equities. And Nick, I want to start off here and talk in this S and P five hundred. Uh, first of all, what levels are you watching? Spot right now, Patrick is forty one thirty five approximately. Uh, there's a call wall above at forty two hundred, which hasn't changed. Put wall below at thirty nine hundred. The implied move for next Friday's May 19th OPEX is plus or minus 65 points. So the upper expected move is 4,200 right where that call wall is. No coincidence there. And the lower expected move is around 4,070. We have key resistance above at 4,150, which we tapped above and then pulled right back below that. Then we obviously tested out the 4,000 key support area, interestingly enough, and bounced off that again. So we're in this trade range right now. Again, key, key resistance above 4,150 and then 4,200. Key support below is 4,100, 4,050, then 4,000. Uh, we keep on bouncing in this range over the last month or so. We've sat between 4,075 and 4,175 basically the entire month and have not moved at all. So very interesting price action here. Um, if we do end up breaking above that 4,150 area and pushing toward 4,200 into next Friday's OPEX, it's possible we see a peak above it. But I'm not sure how much more steam ahead we have given that the market's the market breadth is pretty weak right now. We're seeing, you know, a few names like Google and Amazon and Apple carrying the market higher, whereas everything else is stagnating, so to speak. But right now, you know, again, I think short term, perhaps a little bit more bullish activity, but medium to longer term, I'm quite bearish. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that because for me, the S&P 500, if we look on page four, the S&P 500 has that 4,200 overhead resistance. And uh, even a week or two ago, I was giving the bulls the benefit of the doubt because uh, we were going into an FOMC, we were getting jobs numbers, we uh, now got the inflation prints. Uh, there was all in a, a news that arguably, if, uh, if not bearish, could have given the kind of green light for the bulls to break the market out to a, a higher high and punch 4,300 or higher on the market. Uh, but the market really comes across to me as incredibly exhausted. While the bulls have not dropped the ball here, I mean, at this stage, it's still in bull trend and dips are being bought. But overall, it seems like they have uh, no momentum. And inevitably, that is just going to fall under its own weight. Uh, what we'll be watching for is any legitimate breakdown below 4,100. Conveniently, the 4,000 level is where the 200-day moving average, which I've drawn on here, is there. And it's also where uh, the Fibonacci retracement zone is in that March to April rally. And so um, if we see in any breakdown below 4,100, the major support will come near 4,000. But 
but if we start seeing a distribution cycle like that, we might end up seeing the start of some sort of three to six week kind of correction into the summer. I don't think it has to be the big ominous market drop, but uh, the bulls really have a, uh, to show that they've got uh, some fuel left in the tank and punch this resistance level to go higher failure here. I think we we might end up getting into a bit of a sell cycle. Anyway, uh, let's move on to the NASDAQ because this is where certainly the relative strength has been as we uh, break to a little bit of a higher high here. What are the levels you're watching on the queues? Right you are, Patrick. I mean, we've seen the NASDAQ remain very strong regardless of what the you know, S&P or the Russell have been doing. So right now, spot is 325. Call wall is actually right where we are, we are right now, 325, and a put wall is below at 315. The implied move for next Friday, May 19th, OPEX is plus minus six points. Upper expected move is 331, and the lower expected move is 319 approximately. Key resistance above right now is at 335, and key support below is at 310. And as I mentioned prior, you know we have Google, Apple, Amazon primarily driving the market higher, as well as Microsoft. So we have you know four key names, along with Meta perhaps, four to five key names driving the market higher in the queues, but the S&P is not following suit. It's staying in a choppy range. So... Um, a decent strategy to maybe look at perhaps is is running long long big tech and you know short cautiously the broad market because if we do run higher chances are we're going to see these big names run higher as well. I, I doubt that we run much higher without seeing Apple, Google, Meta, Microsoft, et cetera, run higher as well, right? So um, right now I'm again I'm I'm short term bullish, but I'm medium to long term much more bearish. And I do like Microsoft and Google, as I said previously in other sessions. Uh, so I'm bullish on those names. But again, you, you got to be cautious here because, you know, as we've seen, the market can turn around very fast and that's where it can surprise a lot of people. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is, is that we have to talk about that market breadth continuing to be really weak. So I have on page six that Russell 2000 chart, and we see that even that bounce off that support line, which is uh, just a stone's throw away from its, uh, you know, uh, 52 week lows, still um, showing a predominant weakness in the small caps. But when you were talking about all these mega cap fang stocks continuing to be the leaders, what's interesting is uh, while the S&P 500 is right above uh, add along that 4,200 level where all that resistance is. What's interesting is if you take something like uh, the S&P 500 equal weight index, which uh, uh, doesn't have all these big, huge market cap behemoths uh, as dominant, is 8% off of its February and March highs, and is still 2 or 3% off of even its April highs. We're seeing that yeah, the broader S&P 500 is simply already rolling over. This is uh, the this isn't really going to be just a big question of whether or not these uh, FANG stocks can keep everything afloat. Uh, on page seven, I have the breadth, um, uh, the breadth of the market by just looking at the percentage of stocks that are trading above their 50-day moving averages. And what you see is that we remain and have been through April going here into May below the 50% line, where right now a 45% of stocks above their 50-day moving average just continues to show that there is no breath in this market and it's getting very heavy. And so uh, I'm, I'm becoming incredibly cautious here. Nonetheless, uh, Nick, on page eight, uh, we have that VIX. And what's interesting is in spite of the market being heavy, uh, it's also very quiet and volatility is somewhat still compressed. Uh, we're at the bottom in this range. What are you thinking here? Yeah, so as I said in the past, you know, this uh, the key level is 20, I would say, on the VIX. If we break above that and hold above, we push higher. But again, as I said, for the past few weeks, this zero DTE option activity is suppressing the volatility on the VIX uh, overall. And, you know, yesterday was a great case in point. You know, we opened at 4,155 on SPX. We dropped down to 4,000, basically, and the VIX was relatively flat, right? Like a 55-point drop intraday, and the VIX is flat. So that tells you all, all you need to know right now about the VIX. It's not as meaningful as it once was, perhaps. And so a better gauge might be to look at the option activity on the zero DTEs, which unfortunately is guiding the market in this tight range each and every day. Like what I've been noticing is that if you look at the charts over the past month, uh, the one day chart, look at the market open, the five minute bar and the market close. More often than, than not, we're seeing the market close right where it opened, unless it's a trend day, of course. Right. So if you don't have a catalyst driven trend day, typically the market just reverts back to right where it opened at. And what does, what does that do? It causes the most amount of options to expire worthless, essentially, right? 
So the VIX is being suppressed. Uh, again, I, I don't um, think it's wise to sell too much premium right here because, again, if we do get a pop in the VIX, usually it'll be catalyst driven. Could be the dead ceiling, could be another you know small bank uh, collapse perhaps. But right now, 20 is a key area I'm looking at. If we break above that and hold above that, I see a push perhaps to 25 to 35. But again, that would require some some cataclysmic event like a you know a larger bank collapse perhaps um, or the dead ceiling being pushed out, for example. Yeah, so I have to agree, but uh, the one thing, volatility inevitably will return when the market starts to uh, go through some sort of a correction. I still think that that will be ultimately what will prevail. Uh, while the 20 level to me is important, I really think at this stage, uh, at the real risk point where the market is is uh, really worried about something, I think is even higher where we would need to see a break above like the 25 level that, uh, that really ensues some sort of panic. I think a return turn back to the 2022 vol, which I think is an important level, isn't necessarily going to be driven by uh, fear or panic buying of options. Uh, but we'll see how, uh, how it develops here. Nonetheless, let's move on to uh, page nine, where we have the dollar index. Eric, what are you thinking here on the dollar? No real change in my view from previous weeks. We're consolidating, not crashing. There is no new trend signal until we get a daily close below 100 or over 105 on the Dixie. We're right smack dab in the middle of a nice healthy consolidation. Yeah. Eric, so the the 101 support line I've drawn on here on the uh, on the chart, and uh, we continue to see that support line hold very well. That corresponds with the 110 level on the euro. I continue to think the euro will be the key in order to make a, a real bear case for the dollar breaking down. Really, will rely on uh, making a bull case that the euro is somehow going to be able to beat these key overhead resistance level between 110 to 112. I uh, am just not in that bull camp for the euro or the bear camp for the dollar. I think trade range bound currency is much more likely. If the support line level holds here, I think uh, the dollar trading back to 104 to 105 on the dollar index is uh, is far more likely here. And we'll be looking to see whether these upticks here actually follow through at some point. Now, on page 10 here, we have the chart of the gold futures. What are you guys thinking here? Well, as a gold bull with a sizable long position on, I'm delighted that the market has not moved higher since last week. In my opinion, we need to take our time working through all-time high resistance before a real breakout with gusto can start. So the best case, in my opinion, is if we can keep this consolidation between 2000 and 2064 going all the way, let's say, into July, and then break to new all-time highs. Uh, that would be my, my ideal case. I was hoping that before that happened, we'd get a correction down, so I'd have a chance to add to my longs at lower prices. So far, no luck on that, but uh, I, I am actually quite pleased that we're not seeing the breakout that looked like it was starting to happen last week. Eric, looking at this gold chart, to me, I, I'm starting to see a little bit of divergent momentum. And I continue to think that while gold has a very strong bull case going forward, I think that there's going to be a number of volatile events that will you know, check the, uh, the, these rises and we could see some uh, deeper reversions. I actually uh, suspect that at some stage we could see pullbacks to 1900 or more, and especially if the dollar is strengthening in that cycle. We'll see whether or not some sort of a, a broader macro risk off cycle leads to a little bit of distribution on gold. I don't think we're going to see anything crazy like it returning back to last year's lows. But uh, uh, this rally being checked is something I think is an immediate risk. But I would view almost every pullback in gold here to be a buy on dip. Now, the last chart I wanted to just touch on on page 11 is the copper futures chart. And uh, copper has been uh, put in its high in January. And it's been more or less stuck in a, a distributive little uh, trade range where all rallies were failing and getting heavy. But what we got uh, in the overnight session was a, a, a considerable breakdown below the March and April lows. Uh, and the question now is, is Dr. Copper suggesting something in terms of uh, the, whether the economic slowdown has actually come about? Are we finally going to see uh, some sort of a, a recession kick in? And is copper uh, signaling that uh, one day doesn't make a new trend? This could obviously reverse back to four dollars in the coming week, and and it'd be a nothing burger. But a breakdown like this is worth paying attention. I'm going to be watching this this copper chart going into next week. 
Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck, or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. In this week's Research Roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the article that Mike Green referenced and the chart book we just discussed here in the post game, and a number of links to articles that we found interesting. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening, and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>